The Inconvenient Truth About Women's Suffrage, Part 1, Suffragettes Did Not Believe in Equality. We are taught from a young age that women fought valiantly for equal voting rights under the oppression of the patriarchy because they believed in equality. The reality is, as usual, very different to the propagated victim narrative. In the UK, equal voting rights were brought in gradually in a timeline of events which looks like this. 1832 Reform Act extended voting rights to adult males who rented propertied land of a certain value. At this time, most women did not have aspirations to gain the vote, as they were mostly married to men who cast the vote on behalf of his household, which, of course, included his wife. However, single women who owned land were granted the vote upon request. 1867 Reform Act extended the franchise to men in urban areas who met a property qualification. 1884 Representation of the People Act addressed imbalances between the boroughs and the countryside. This brought the voting population to 5.5 million, although 40% of males were still disenfranchised because of the property qualification. Between 1885 and 1918, moves were made by the women's suffrage movement to ensure votes for women. However, the duration of the First World War stopped this reform movement. By 1900, more than one million single women were registered to vote in local government elections in England. Representation of the People Act, 1918. The consequences of World War I persuaded the government to expand the right to vote. All men aged 21 and over were given the right to vote. Property restrictions for voting were lifted for men. Votes were given to 40% of women with property restrictions and limited to those over 30 years old. 1928 saw the representation of the People Act, equal suffrage for women and men with voting possible at 21 with no property restrictions. As you can see, there was a period of 10 years where working class women under 30 were not able to vote, whereas their male counterparts were. Why then are we continuing to glorify women's plight for a measly 10 years of inequality in light of the fact that all working class people had endured centuries of not having the vote? The voting rights of both men and women had historically been denied by the government, yet they were still required, of course, to pay taxes. How then can we argue that it was a case of women being oppressed by men? This is akin to making the argument that white men owned black slaves, which included women, therefore the problem was that women were oppressed by men, rather than blacks were oppressed by whites. What a twisted half-truth the former argument would be in light of the reality of the situation. Why then do we try to apply the same logic to suffrage? In 1914, Admiral Charles Fitzgerald set up the Order of the White Feather, an organisation designed to shame men into enlisting in the British Army by having women hand them a white feather in public if they were not wearing a uniform. Where is the outrage over this sexist practice? Prominent feminists and suffragettes of the time, including our heroine Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughter Christabel, joined this movement and became part of the effort to shame men, including those men who didn't even have the vote because they were not of a certain age or did not own land, and so had absolutely no say in which government they would be answerable to. Pretty crucial when, as a man, your life literally depended on it. Yes, those same women who fought for equality between the genders saw no hypocrisy in publicly shaming men who resisted the draft, which was enforced on them purely based on their gender. And now that we know the truth, will we continue our hypocrisy in commending these women for their stance on equality?